our time together. Lord, thank you for those who've gathered here tonight. Thank you for those who are watching online. And thank you for your word. Your word is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, it has a way of piercing. It reaches down to the joints and the marrow of our bones and it divides soul from spirit. We ask you to speak to us tonight through your word and make me a faithful messenger of this word. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight we're in part seven in our study of the book of Revelation. Title of tonight's teaching is The Seven Bowls, The Great Prostitute, and the Fall of Babylon. We are in chapters 15 through 18. We have printed notes in the back of the room on the table. We also have uh, notes on the, uh, on the, on the inter internet for you. If you touch the link on your screen there, it'll open the notes for you. And I usually like to begin with a little introduction uh, to kind of give an overview of what we're going to be looking at in our study tonight. So let's look into that if you have your notes. In this section that we're looking at this evening, we encounter the seven bowl judgments. That's the final outpouring of divine wrath against human rebellion. And those we will see in chapters 15 and 16. Some of these judgments you will see parallel the plagues that were visited on Egypt under Moses just prior to the Exodus. They include horrible malignant sores, water turned to blood, people scorched by an overheating sun, and thick agonizing darkness. Nevertheless, we are told that the people, quote, cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores, but they did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give him glory. Chapter 16, verse 9. Then we come to chapter 17 and we're introduced to Mystery Babylon, the great prostitute who sits on many waters. And this is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time tonight, chapter 17. John is shown a woman clothed in purple and scarlet, glittering with gold, holding a cup full of abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. She rides a scarlet beast covered with blasphemous names and with seven heads and ten horns. This harlot represents a unification of the world's false religions, including the apostate church, that is in league with the Antichrist. We might think of this prostitute as the anti-church. This false religious system will dominate and deceive millions of people worldwide. We take that from the verse that says, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Sitting on them suggests that she dominates vast numbers of people and even national destinies are in her sway. That's chapter 17, verses 15 through 16. She will serve the beast by persecuting the true church. It says she is drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Therefore, God decrees her downfall and destruction, spelling the end of false religion in the world forever. Ironically, the woman will fall prey to the very beast upon which she sits. Then in chapter 18, John's vision of this woman suddenly morphs and it's no longer a woman sitting on a beast, but it's a great city, but still has the name Babylon attached to it. This great city represents the secular counterparts to the false religion symbolized by the prostitute. The city represents the political and commercial systems of the world that are also in rebellion against God. They are characterized by materialistic consumerism and shocking brutality. Like the great prostitute, the great city will also meet its doom as it falls under the direct judgment of God. At the demise of these wicked systems, the cry rings out from heaven, 
Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen. Rejoice over her fate, people of God and apostles and prophets, for at last God has judged her for your sakes. So we're going to move into chapter 15. If you have your Bible, you want to turn there with us. And there John says he sees another marvelous event of great significance. Remember he said that in chapter 12 about the dragon and the woman that he saw in the sky. This is the seven angels who are about to pour out the vials or the bowls of the wrath of God. But it says they were singing along with some victorious saints. They were singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. That's verses 1 and 2 if you're looking in your Bible. If you wonder what is the song of Moses and the Lamb? Well, we know what the Psalm of Moses is, Song of Moses. It's found in Deuteronomy 32, verses 40 through 44. This is where God tells Moses right near the end of his life, just before he is to die and pass the baton of leadership to Joshua. God says to Moses, I want you to write a song and I want you to sing it for the people and I want you to teach them to sing it. And it's a long, long song that it, 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 it uh, chronicles the rebellion of Israel that will come. It's like a, a, a prophecy of what is going to happen to the people of God because of their rebellion. But then near the end of the song, God says he promises that he is going to bring vengeance on those who have persecuted his people. And I'd like to look at those verses because it is very germane to what's happening here in Revelation at this point. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 40 uh, and 41 says, Now I raise my hand to heaven and declare, this is God speaking through Moses, As surely as I live, when I sharpen my flashing sword and begin to carry out justice, I will take revenge on my enemies and repay those who reject me. And then verse 43 Rejoice with him, you heavens, and let all of God's angels worship him. Sounds very reminiscent of what we're reading here in Revelation. For he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will take revenge against his enemies. He will repay those who hate him and cleanse the land for his people. Verse 44 says, So Moses came with Joshua, son of Nun, and recited all the words of this song to the people. So now, you know, 3,000 plus years later, we see the people of God and the angels of God singing that same song in reference to what is about to happen as God draws his sharp sword and avenges the blood of his righteous martyrs who have died for their faith down through the centuries. What is the song of the Lamb? Well, we have that in Revelation 5, 11, and 12, which is a song of redemption. It says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. The crucifixion is always front and center throughout the book of Revelation. We've pointed this out before in this study that we keep being drawn back to this central point of human history, the dividing line between B.C. and A.D., the most important event in all of time is the fact that God has given His Son as a sacrifice to save us from our sins, and we are again reminded of that in this song of the Lamb. In verses 5 through 8, we are again directed to these seven angels who are standing there at attention, waiting to be given these bowls. Each of them will be given a bowl by one of the four living creatures that we met over in chapter 4 that surround the throne of God and cry, Holy, Holy, Holy. They attend the deity and they come and bring these bowls to each of these seven angels. In verse uh, 
5, I believe it is, it says the seven angels were clothed in spotless white linen. What is the significance of that? Well, it suggests that the judgments about to be poured out are righteous judgments carried out by holy emissaries from God Himself. In other words, what is about to happen is not just a natural calamity or disaster. It's not something that can be explained in any other way but the just, just judgment of God. And it is right. It is holy. And we will see that theme repeated again and again that the judgments that the people are experiencing are righteous judgments. Why do you think they need to be told that? Because there is a tendency to blame God, to accuse God, to suggest that God is not just. He has no right to punish me because He just simply disagrees with my lifestyle. And again and again we are told, no, these are righteous judgments. They are just. And you'll see that as we go through it. So then we come to chapter 16 where we actually will now be given those seven uh, bold judgments. By the way, judgment is often depicted in Scripture as being poured from a cup. Susan, can you pull up Psalm 75, 8 or Isaiah 51, 17 <clears throat> if, if uh, you have those handy? Um, you will see them when they go up. But it's talking about God pouring out His cup of wrath and judgment upon the uh, nations and the unbelievers. And uh, we even see it in Matthew in the Gethsemane uh, you know, encounter with Jesus where um, He says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from Me. What cup was He talking about? He was talking about the cup of judgment, divine wrath on the sins of humanity that he is about to drink. You remember he had said to his disciples, are you able to drink from the cup that I will drink from? And they said, yes. And he said, well, indeed, you will drink from the cup that I drink from. So this is the idea here. And in, actually, in ancient times, they didn't use cups as we think of a cup, like you're holding some of you right now. They actually drank from bowls. Okay, so the bold judgments, the pouring out of God's wrath. So in verse 2, bowl number 1 are malignant sores that come upon people. Bowl number 2, the sea is turned to blood. Bowl number 3, the rivers and springs are turned to blood. And by the way, there is reason to believe that these judgments may not necessarily be worldwide or global judgments in the sense that every ocean and sea in the world or every river and spring in the world. Remember what we said last week about the, the word earth or land, that they are interchangeable. It's the same Hebrew word, eretz, that means both and the context determines how it is applied. So when it says it's poured out on the earth, it could mean it's poured out on the land, which could refer to the land of Israel or the lands uh, surrounding Israel, you know, where the uh, regime of the Antichrist is headquartered. So bear that in mind that this doesn't necessarily mean that it is a worldwide universal uh, experience here. Um, after this business of the waters turning to blood, we have the angels refrain in verse 5 saying, you are just, O Holy One, watch this, you are just, O Holy One, because you have sent these judgments. Since they shed the blood of your holy people, you have given them blood to drink. Your judgments are true and just. See that theme? Again, we're being reminded, uh, don't give in to this idea that somehow God is not doing right when He rains down judgment. He is the only one who is right as a judge. The only one who's qualified to judge. And He is so merciful 
But there comes a point when his mercy runs out and he sends the judgment. In verse 8, we have bowl number 4. The sun heats up and scorches people. But notice in verse 9, how do people re respond to that? They curse God and they do not repent. That's what the scripture says. Verse 10, bowl number 5, we have the Antichrist kingdom plunged into darkness. It says it's such a thick darkness that the people gnaw their tongues in agony. That is a pretty thick darkness. And remember, that was one of the plagues that was visited upon Egypt, wasn't it? On the Pharaoh's dominion. Again, in verse 11, still the people did not repent. Judy? So paralyzing was the divine presence yeah. that was there as they were sitting in that dark, the darkness like they had never felt before. It wasn't just the, the sunshine. Yeah. It was the presence there. I, I agree. You know, I remember years ago we went into one of these big caves. I don't remember if it was the Mammoth Cave somewhere. And we got down into the subterranean corridors of that thing and the park ranger who was leading our little entourage through it gave us a little speech about the stalactites and stalagmites and all of that and then he said now I want you to prepare yourself because I'm going to do something and uh, don't worry it's not going to last long but we're going to turn off the lights and he turned those lights off and for just a minute it was a, there was a panic that rose up within you the thought, what if they don't come back on? How in the world would we ever find our way out of this place? It was scary for just a minute. And then after a few minutes, a few seconds. It, but I think you're right. There is there, there can be a presence in the darkness that just intensifies it. And then in verse 12, we have bowl number six, where the Euphrates River is dried up so that the kings of the east, think China, North Korea, the kings of the east march their armies toward the west. And look in verses 13 and 14, it says three demonic spirits, Judy, there's that demonic element, issue from the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet to lure world powers to gather for battle against the Lord at Armageddon. So if you've ever heard of the battle of Armageddon, how many of you have heard that term. Well, that, this is exactly where it comes from. And we'll see it again before we get through the book of Revelation. But let's take a minute and just pick that word apart and let's understand what it, where the word comes from. The, the word Armageddon is the English uh, derivative of the two Hebrew words Har Megiddo. What does that mean? Har means hill, and Megiddo is a city in northern Israel. It was a fortress city fortified by Solomon, and you know, and it was in existence before Solomon, but he fortified it. I've been to the ruins of that city, and it sits on a, a high promontory, a hill. When you stand on Mount Carmel in northern Israel, up in the Galilee, uh, not far from the Mediterranean over here. If you look this way, you see Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo. And then out before you is the valley of Jezreel, and it is a huge agricultural plateau or plain that is very verdant and rich with crops. It's beautiful. It's like looking at the patchwork from an airplane when you see the agricultural area. That's what it looks like below you from this high promontory. And on the other side of the valley is the Nazareth Ridge where Jesus lived. And if you follow that down here, you come to Shunem where Gideon fought the Midianites. And then at the end of the valley down there is Mount Tabor. Some say it was the Mount of Transfiguration. And also, I can't think of the name of it, but the mount where Saul and Jonathan were killed. Somebody might know what that is. But anyway, so you have all of this 
geography in such a small place, relatively speaking, and uh, the Megiddo in this is the, the city that I was referring to that overlooks this valley. That's where the battle is going to be fought, in the valley of Jezreel. And it's, it's going to be a, a major, major conflict that will spill over into probably all parts of uh, the nation of Israel and beyond, but it'll, it'll converge, the forces will converge there just below Har Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo, and that's, that's how they get the name Armageddon. So anyway, let's move along. Then the next thing is Jesus speaks here. After we are told that these forces are going to come together to fight the Lord at Har Megiddo, Jesus steps in and says, Look, I will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are those are, are all who are watching for me who keep their clothing ready so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. And then finally, in verses 17 through 21, we come to the last bowl of judgment that is poured out. And at that point, there is a voice that rings out and says, it is finished. Where have you heard that before? From the cross. Same words here. What does that signify? It signifies this. There are two great eternal judgments. One took place at Golgotha. The other will take place at the end when God rains these bowls of judgment on humanity. And uh, it, it, it also includes the ultimate final judgment at the great white throne. So which judgment do you want to be a part of? If you bow at the cross and accept the fact that Jesus suffered the wrath of God in our place. And when He died, He said, it is finished. He meant the plan of redemption is finished, but He also meant the wrath of God is finished. It's, it's poured out. It is absorbed in the Son of God. He absorbed the wrath of God in its whole so that those who trust in Christ Never need fear of that judgment. There is therefore now no judgment, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He cried out, it is finished for us. But for those who reject His sacrifice and refuse to humble themselves in repentance before Him, there is no other alternative but to face that ultimate judgment of God when it will be finished again. Uh, there's also a great earthquake, uh, catastrophic geological changes. You can read about those here in Bowl 7. And it says a terrible hailstorm with huge hailstones the size of a millstone. And verse 21 says, in spite of this, do they repent? No. They cursed God because of the terrible plague of the hailstone. So those are the last of the judgments of God. We've seen the seven seals that open up and reveal the seven trumpets and then the seven bowls of God's final judgment at this point. We come to chapter 17 and here's where I want to focus uh, just about the bulk of, of our time left. We're going to read this chapter in its entirety. The judgment of the great prostitute. <clears throat> chapter 17, verse 1. One of the seven angels who had poured out the seven bowls came over and spoke to me. Come with me, he said, and I will show you the judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute who rules over many waters. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her, and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. So the angel took me in the spirit into a wilderness where I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that had seven heads and ten horns. It's the beast that has the seven heads and ten horns, not the woman, okay? And blasphemies against God were written all over it, over the beast. 
The woman wore purple and scarlet clothing and beautiful jewelry made of gold and precious gems and pearls. In her hand, she held a gold goblet full of obscenities and the impurities of her immorality. A mysterious name was written on her forehead. And if you're looking at your notes, you will see how this appears in the New King James Version. They show it as if you're actually seeing the uh, engraving or whatever you would call it on, on her forehead. It says, a mysterious name was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great, mother of all prostitutes and obscenities in the world. I could see that she was drunk, drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses for Jesus. I stared at her in complete amazement. Why are you so amazed? The angel asked. I will tell you the mystery of this woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns on which she sits. The beast you saw was once alive but isn't now, and yet he will soon come up out of the bottomless pit and go to eternal destruction. And the people who belong to this world, whose names were not written in the book of life before the world was made, will be amazed at the reappearance of this beast who had died. If you remember last week, we talked about the beast in chapter 13, that one of the seven heads was wounded with a fatal wound, and yet he comes back to life, and the whole world wonders after him because he's been, you know, pseudo-resurrected as a counterfeit resurrection to sort of mirror or mimic the resurrection of God's Son. Verse 9, this calls for a mind with understanding. The seven heads of the beast represent the seven hills where the woman rules. Remember, Rome is a city on seven hills. Now, whether this is a reference to Rome or not is open to interpretation. They also represent seven kings. Five kings have already fallen. The sixth now reigns and the seventh is yet to come, but his reign will be brief. Some believe that this is a reference to the uh, the emperors and Caesars of ancient Rome that was persecuting the people of God. And of course, John was among the persecuted as he writes from the Isle of Patmos. There are others who see this as referring to great world empires that have come and gone, and yet others are still to rise. Verse 11, the scarlet beast that was but is no longer is the eighth king. He is like the other seven, and he too is headed for destruction. The ten horns of the beast, note this, are ten kings who have not yet risen to power. They will be appointed to their kingdoms for one brief moment to reign with the beast. They will all agree to give him their power and authority. So that gives us the idea that the Antichrist will not just rule over one country or nation, but over an empire of multiple jurisdictions that have pledged their allegiance to him. Verse 14, together they will go to war. Now this is an interesting verse here. Together, the Antichrist and these various jurisdictions will go together to war against the Lamb. But the Lamb will defeat them. Hallelujah. Do you know why he will defeat them? Because he is the Lord of all lords and the King of all kings. And his called and chosen and faithful ones will be with him. When he comes to fight the battle of Armageddon, we're coming with him on white horses. Enoch prophesied, behold, I saw the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, when Jesus comes back, those who have died in him will God bring with him. Amen. We had a precious Roman Catholic lady saved during the time we were ministering in New Orleans in our early years of marriage back in 1974. And she knew nothing about the Bible. She had never read the Bible until she came into the church there and started reading. She got to Revelation and read about the saints coming back on white horses. And she got so upset, she ran to the church, to the parsonage, and found us pastors and 
She said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I am scared to death of horses. I don't know <laughs> how in this world I'm going to be any good at that. <laughs> she was honest. Um, she also came up, her husband Clay was a bar, owned a bar, and he hadn't gotten saved, at least not fully saved. He did a little ushering in our little tiny church, which was more of a mission than anything else. And, you know, he kind of uh, tended to nudge people if they didn't put anything in the plate. He'd stand there and elbow them until they did. But one day Betty, her name was Betty Roberts, had the same last name as we do, but no kin. She came running to the church. She was so upset. She said, Clay says he doesn't want to go to the marriage supper of the lamb. Well, why, Betty? Because he doesn't like lamb. <laughs> so anyway, it's okay to kind of get a little bit of a laugh here and there. Out of this. It's so serious, but we're going to be with him when he fights that battle. Amen? Amen. And you don't have to worry about falling off your horse or getting shot. It ain't going to happen because we're going to be in glorified bodies. Yeah. Hallelujah. You talk about Superman. We're, amen, invulnerable. Verse 15. Then the angel said to me, the waters where the prostitute is ruling, here's the, the scripture interpreting itself, is ruling, represent masses of people of every nation and language. So this woman, this harlot that he sees sitting on this beast obviously has some kind of massive jurisdiction or control over many, many people in the world. The scarlet beast and his ten horns all hate the prostitute. They will strip her naked. Wait, you say, well, wait a minute. How is she able to sit on the beast if he hates her? We're going to explain that in just a moment. They will strip her naked, eat her flesh, and burn her remains with fire. For God has put a plan into their minds, a plan that will carry out his purposes. Isn't that interesting? The Bible says God can turn the heart of a king. And even though this, these are wicked, antichrist kings, God is still in control. And He <laughs> induces them to do the very thing that He wants them to do. Why do you think Caesar Augustus issued a decree that all the world should be taxed? Because God wanted Jesus to be born in Bethlehem and not in Nazareth. And God can make a ruler, a world ruler, do things he doesn't even know why he's doing them. God is in control. Amen? Amen? And I'm not saying that everything that happens is because God made it happen. I'm not saying that. But I am saying God can pull that leash anytime he chooses. Hallelujah! It says they will agree, these ten kings will give their authority to the scarlet beast, and so the words of God will be fulfilled. And this woman you saw in your vision represents the great city that rules over the kings of the world. Now let's take that apart a little bit, this 17th chapter. And the very first thing I want to ask is, what is Babylon? Why is this harlot called Babylon, mother of all harlots and abominations? Well, we know from biblical, the biblical story that Babylon is a city in Mesopotamia, or was in ancient times. They have found the ruins of Babylon. It was uh, Mesopotamia, by the way, was the cradle of civilization, we believe. And this city Babylon, we are told in the Bible, was originally built by Nimrod, who was a charismatic but ungodly warrior king. We're told in Genesis 10, 8, that he was the first heroic warrior on earth. Heroic doesn't mean he was good. It means that he was epic. He, he was historic. He made a big splash. Nimrod probably led the rebellion against God at the Tower of Babel. So that's the second little clue about Babylon. It was the site of the Tower of Babel where God confused the languages. It was the scene of man's first corporate rebellion against God after Noah's flood. And you know that the tower was probably a ziggurat which was designed for occultic worship. You read all about that in Genesis chapter 11. Third thing we know about Babylon, it was the capital city, became the capital city of the Babylonian Empire, known for sacking Jerusalem in 586 B.C. 
and cruelly oppressing and exiling God's people under Nebuchadnezzar and his successors. It was a brutal and ruthless regime. And then number four, Babylon, because of the foregoing points that I've just mentioned, Babylon became a symbol of man's rebellion against God. It is also a system. Say the word system with me. It is a system of ungodliness that worships material things, exercises ruthless power over people, involves the occult, and has virulent hatred for God and God's people. This system is rooted in the serpent's original lie. He told this to Eve in the garden, didn't he? You don't need God. You can be your own God. You can decide for yourself what is good and evil. Go ahead, taste the good and the evil, and you decide what's what instead of listening to God. And the devil's been telling that lie ever since. John, the same one who wrote the book of Revelation, in his first epistle told us that this system that we're referring to as Babylon here, he says, is the spirit of Antichrist. And John said of his day, it is already in the world. Well, of course it was because it had been in the world since the Garden of Eden. Today, we see the spirit of Antichrist or Babylon reflected in the tenets of secular humanism, Darwinian evolution, Marxism, totalitarianism, the modern feminist movement, the LGBTQ movement, and on and on and on. All of these are manifestations of this Babylon system, the spirit of Antichrist that is in the world. All of these ideologies and movements that I've just mentioned reject the God of the Bible and the values that he he wants us to follow. They are totally rejected by each and every one of those ideologies. Let me ask you a question. How do you explain this? How do you explain the fact that secular humanists in our journalistic media, the talking heads that we watch on television news time, on a major networks and cable networks, how do you explain the fact that these people are secular humanists who hate religious faith and the God of Christianity, and yet they sympathize with and support the Muslims. Have you ever noticed that? They are always sympathetic to the cause of the Muslims, and yet they hate Religious faith because they're secularists. They don't even believe in God. How do you reconcile that? How do you explain that? The spirit of Antichrist is in both systems. It's in the secularists and it's in the spirit of Islam. They recognize where it comes from. Exactly. They're brothers. They're twin brothers. They're Siamese twins, though they don't know that. They don't understand that. But they're bedfellows. And so they're in league with each other makes no logical sense unless you understand the deeper streams that flow through both systems and many other systems. Let me, let me go on with the notes here. The mystery, and this is my, by the way, everything I'm sharing with you is my interpretation. Remember, I made that clear from the get-go. That I wouldn't say that all the time because I'm assuming you know that if I'm sharing something with you, it's what I think it means. It doesn't mean that's what it means. And there are other points of view, but this is what I believe. And, and I would suggest the mystery about mystery Babylon could be how through a proportionately small number of individuals, it has managed to dominate the world with its lie. The spirit of Babylon has infected and poisoned all of human society, including the seven mountains of culture, which are religion, family, education, government, media, arts and entertainment, and business. Would you agree with that? That in all of those various systems, the spirit of Antichrist, of Babylon, is there. I mean, I don't care if it's Disney World. The spirit of Antichrist is all over it. 
It's the movies we watch, the spirit of Antichrist in the corporate business world, the spirit of who do you think is pushing the transgender and the LGBTQ agenda more than the government, more than higher education. It's the corporate world. They're putting it in their commercials now and they are, uh, they, they, they are, uh, you know, supporting it and obvious because it's, it means financial gain to them, they think, but they're, and so we see the spirit of Babylon in all of these various cultural systems of our society. And this statement, obviously Babylon is a spiritual system. Say that with me, a spiritual system under the control of the ancient serpent that infiltrates and dominates every aspect of the present world. And let me say it like this. In other words, Babylon is a systemic rebellion that will have its ultimate manifestation in the Antichrist regime. Systemic rebellion. People talk today about systemic racism. The idea that it's in all of our systems and in all of us and that America is inherently and historically racist from its beginnings, from its roots, and it will always be that way. I disagree with that. But I'll tell you what is systemic is rebellion against God. There is systemic rebellion in our government, in our higher education, in our corporate world, in our entertainment media, in the journalistic media. In all of these systems, there is systemic rebellion against God because they are shot through with the spirit of Antichrist. Amen. So when we talk about Babylon here, understand it's not referring to a literal woman but she is a symbol of, of a religious system that is a part of the Babylon regime. Now, I ask the question in your notes, why is Babylon depicted as a woman and a prostitute? Well, number one, first of all, I want you to note the similarities between John's vision of the woman in Revelation 17 and a vision that the prophet Zechariah had over in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 5, and I want to I put this in your notes for a purpose. I want you to note the striking similarities between the Old and New Testament visions that we have here. It says, Then the angel who was talking with me came forward and said, Look up and see what's coming. What is it, I asked? He replied, It is a basket for measuring grain. It is filled with the sins of everyone throughout the erets, the land. It could mean out throughout the earth. It's a bushel basket that that the prophet is seeing coming toward him. Then the heavy lead cover, there's a cover on the top of the basket, was lifted off the basket, and look, there was a woman sitting inside it. The angel said, the woman's name is, capital W, Wickedness. And he pushed her back into the basket and closed the heavy lid again. Then I looked up and saw two women flying toward us, gliding on the wind. They had wings like a stork. And they picked up the basket and flew into the sky. All of this is symbolic language, not to be taken literally. It's a vision. It has significance if we understand what the symbols are referring to. Verse 10, where are they taking the basket? I asked the angel. He replied, you tell me what he replied. To the land of Babylonia. If you read that in the King James Version, it will say Shinar because in the Hebrew language, Shinar is the word they use for Babylon. It means the same thing. Where they will build a temple for the basket, and when the temple is ready, they will set the basket there on its pedestal. What is it saying? It is saying that Babylon is a place where wickedness has been enthroned. And where all of the sins of the world are represented there by this Evil, wicked, rebellious system. Rebellious against God. So you see the parallels in Scripture? You see the correspondence between the Old and the New Testament? All of it is the beautiful Word of God that has so much cohesiveness to it because it's written by one divine author. Hallelujah. Now, here are some thoughts I just penned. I was praying and thinking and reading and studying this a, a, a couple of weeks ago or so. And... Um, as I did, I just 
had a stream of consciousness, so to speak, things that just began to uh, occur to me, and I was writing them down as, as it came. And so let me just read to you what, what, what I see in this. Womankind is wonderful. How many of you ladies would agree with that statement? Amen? Amen. She is the delicate and delightful version of the human species, a step further removed from the dust of the earth from which her more earthy masculine counterpart was formed. There is a wedding ceremony I've used a number of times over the years that has this little phrase in it that man is dust refined and woman is dust doubly refined. If you think about it, man was made from the dust of the earth, but woman was made from man. And so she's more delicate. That's where the femininity comes from. God wants women to be feminine, not, not to uh, try to be masculine. And there are degrees of that. And, and that's not a reference to, um, you know, criticize anyone uh, because we're all a little different and, and there are degrees of difference. But it, it, I think it breaks God's heart when women intentionally try to be masculine, to be like a man. And the vice versa is true as well. There's something so beautiful. There is a delightful mystique about the feminine, something so appealing and alluring that it has powerful influence for good or ill. Even in the Garden of Eden, the serpent understood the power of the feminine mystique and in his cunning scheme to corrupt humanity at its inception, he deceived the woman. Why do you think he went to the woman and not to the man? The woman fell under the spell of the serpent. And here's the answer to the question. And Adam fell under the spell of the woman. And the enemy knew what he was doing. And we guys do fall under those spells, don't we? Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, oh, look at the history of the world. Now, from the beginning, God had planned a wonderful and lofty role for womankind. Godly women following the divine plan are powerful influencers for good in the world. As William Ross Wallace put it, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Tragically, throughout history, women have been dominated and mistreated by men and assigned a subordinate role in society. God predicted this when he explained the effects of the curse that would befall womankind due to the fall. He said to Eve, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Masculine domination. The modern secularist feminist movement is a pushback against this ageless masculine domination. Regrettably, this movement has also fallen prey to the serpent's deception as it offers God no place within its ranks. It has no appreciation for God's divine order for the family, especially for the roles he has assigned to husbands and wives. Women's self-efforts to overcome masculine subjugation have always proved tragic. Jezebel, Athaliah, and Herodias are names of women that will live in infamy because of their manipulative control over their husbands and even nations. We're talking about why is this, this uh, figure in chapter 17 depicted as a woman and as a prostitute. The original rebellion involved a deceived woman, didn't it? Who was that deceived woman? Eve, mother of all the living. That's what her name means, by the way. Adam named her. In Zechariah's vision... Wickedness is portrayed as a woman being enthroned in Babylon, of all places. Why should we be surprised that the final rebellion is depicted symbolically as a woman? The church of Jesus Christ is often depicted as a virtuous bride. Why should we be surprised if the anti-church is depicted as a prostitute? You see the counterparts... The contrast, I should say, between the virtue of the bride of Christ and the abominable immorality of this 
mother of harlots that represents worldwide apostate religion. In the Old Testament, Israel was often depicted as an unfaithful wife, an adulteress, a harlot, because she betrayed Yahweh, her rightful husband, and went a-whoring after other gods, to quote the scripture. Idolatry is spiritual adultery. Similarly, the great prostitute in Revelation 17 is no longer the bride of Christ, if indeed she ever was. The kings of the earth have committed adultery with her and the people who belong to this world have been made drunk by the wine of her immorality. That's Revelation 17, 2. So this prostitute is a false religious system, probably a confederation of world religions led by professing Christians under the guise of admirable ecumenism. And I want you to note the following characteristics. We just read this, so I'm just picking out the points that we saw when we read chapter 17. Number one, this prostitute is worldly and wields immense political power. (coughs) Worldly power. It says she rules over many waters, and we saw what that meant in verse 15. Peoples, multitudes, nations. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her. So she is in league with the power brokers of the world. Far cry from the early church that we see in the book of Acts, which were outcasts and and totally denuded of any kind of worldly power or influence. Their only power was spiritual power. But my, how they shook the world. And it seems to be that the more the church rises in political dominance, the less our spiritual authority and vice versa. Secondly, this prostitute is in league with the Antichrist regime. She sits on, she's being carried by the scarlet beast. She's being propped up and supported by this wicked system of the Antichrist. Number three, She is rich in material wealth. She wore purple and scarlet, jewelry, gold, and so forth. Number four, she's sexually immoral, full of obscenities and impurities of her immorality. Let me tell you, there are churches that are historic churches that once were bastions of the true faith of Jesus Christ that are now ordaining homosexuals as bishops in their church. I want you to know we welcome homosexuals at Trinity Church. But we're not going to ordain them. And we're not going to let them teach our children. But we will love them. We will fellowship with them. We'll hopefully love them to Christ. Where if they repent at the foot of the cross, Jesus will save them as quick as He would save any of us. He loves them. And we love them. But we do not condone the lifestyle. And when it says obscenities and impurities of her immorality, you just name it. Any one of a dozen different kinds of immoralities, sexual, homosexual, heterosexual, you put it all together and it's here in the cup this woman holds. Number five, She persecutes true followers of Jesus. We're talking about this confederation of false religions in this last time when the Antichrist will rule. It says she is drunk with the blood of God's holy people who were witnesses. You want to get a a visual or a mental picture of this woman. Just close your your eyes and imagine these bars where these people ride these bulls and you picture a drunk woman with a, a keg of beer, uh, not a keg of beer, but a, a stein of beer in her hand, and she's riding that, that bull, and she is jocular and hilarious and making a fool of herself. And that's the picture that I see when I think of this woman on the scarlet beast. But what's in her mug is not beer, but the blood of the martyrs that she has slaughtered. Number six, she will be deposed by the very beast she was in league with. The Bible says the scarlet beast and his ten horns hate the prostitute. 
they'll strip her and so forth, burn her with fire. Well, down uh, next under the, the bold uh, text there, the po here's a possible scenario to explain how this all might, might materialize. This is just, this is just um, using sanctified imagination, okay? It's not necessarily the way it'll play out, but could. So think about it with me. As the individual we call the Antichrist begins to rise to power, a worldwide religious confederation of the world's major religions will join forces with the Antichrist for the advantages they see in such an alliance. At first, the leaders of this religious confederation will assume that they are the dominant power and that they even control the Antichrist. You see, the woman was sitting on the beast, which suggests controlling and domination. The Antichrist is content to allow this for a while because the anti-church serves his purpose by persecuting the true church. However, at the halfway point of the seven-year tribulation, the Antichrist will declare himself God and enthrone himself in the Jewish temple. He will banish all other forms of worship. Paul tells us that in 2 Thessalonians 2.4. At this point, the beast will turn on the woman who rides it, throw her to the ground, trample and tear her to pieces. In other words, the Antichrist and his regime will ruthlessly exterminate the leaders of the religious confederation and outlaw its representative religions. And then we have verse 18 at the end of chapter 17. And as John is looking at this vision of the woman riding the beast, suddenly the vision morphs. And he clears his eyes and looks again, and it's no longer a woman riding a beast. Now it is a great city. And so we come to chapter 18. Yes, George. Do you not see some similarities? I mean, I don't know. A foreshadow of this, of the fact that the combining of the church and the Absolutely. government. Yes. Yes. You know, I, I'm just scared of some of the phrases that I hear now. Take over the government. Yeah. Uh, not supposed to be there. Separation of church and state is a biblical principle. It's not just a Western dem democratic. In fact, much of the uh, laws and you know our government was derived from the Bible. You know, King Saul tried to usurp the role of Samuel the priest by offering a sacrifice and God severely reprimanded him. There was a, a king, I think Isaiah, uh, one of the kings of Judah, did the same thing, went into the temple to offer the sacrifice and God smote him with leprosy. What's he saying? He doesn't want the state taking over the church and he doesn't want the church taking over the state. The church is to be a prophetic voice to the state and we have ever, not just the right, we have the responsibility to speak to the state, to tell them what you're doing is wrong in the sight of God. It contradicts His Word. That is a valid role of the church. But it is not the role of the church but if you get to, too close, to dictate you know policy, to make law, to run the law. Voice That's right. If you get sick, well, I can influence them. And see, that was the system in Europe and in England that our early founders were wanting to get away from. The church was the state. The church was the state and the state was the church. Exactly. Very good point. Okay. <clears throat> we are almost done, but let's just take a minute and just pause just before we jump into chapter 18, and I'm not going to nearly elaborate it as we did chapter 17, but... Any comments or questions at this point? Any thoughts that have come to your mind about anything we've talked about? Okay. You are easy to please. It seems strange, too, that we're talking about the government. You know, God's original plan was that God would rule people. And then the people decided they wanted a king. Yeah. And ever since then, it's wanted more and more control and that's like the opposite of the kingdom so there's always been a uh, uh, tension yeah yeah between government and, and God's ways 
Much of human government has gone away from God historically. That, that is so true. <clears throat> Can I just Absolutely. mention one thing? Um, if anybody's been paying attention to the Euphrates, it's at its lowest level in 30 years. Um, in August, it, they noted that it's a humanitarian catastrophe. Since January of 2021, the waters plummeted by five meters, and now others inches above dead still. And their power generation has already fallen by 70% because it's at the level where turbines are com completely stopped from producing electricity. And most of the people get their fresh drinking water from that. So that's also, and it, it does the crops because the drought and everything, 90% of the flow is, has been cut off. Wow, that's interesting. In case those at home didn't hear that, Sandy O'Connick was just sharing with us, there are reports the Euphrates River is at its lowest point in terms of the volume of water. It's like it's drying up. So, yeah. Very interesting. Is that coincidence or is that fulfillment of prophecy? Right. Yeah. Okay. Chapter 18, verse 2. Babylon is fallen. That great city is fallen. A city. And talking about a prostitute on a scarlet beast, now we're talking about a city, but it has the same name, Babylon. What's the significance of that? Well, the city Babylon is the political and commercial counterpart to the false religious system we've just been talking about in chapter 17, depicted by the prostitute. The prostitute represents false religion, under the sway of the beast, and the city represents government, business, culture, and the other elements of society that are also in league with the beast. So the import of this chapter, and it's all about the fall, the destruction of the Babylon system, the entire Babylon system that has infected the world for millennia will finally, hallelujah, come under the judgment of of God and be purged from the earth. Let me just say something real quick. In the early 5th century AD, St. Augustine wrote a book called The City of God. It was right after the Visigoths had sacked Rome. That was 410 AD. This event left Romans in a deep state of shock. They saw it as punishment for abandoning the traditional Roman religions in favor of Christianity. So Augustine wrote this book as an argument for the truth of Christianity over competing religious and uh, systems and philosophies. And in the book, he contrasts the people of God, which he refers to as the city of God. Remember, in the Bible, city always means people, not not so much land mass, but it talks about the folks who come together to create that city. It's a living thing. Not just buildings and streets and asphalt and concrete. It's the people who occupy it. Same we're going to see it, listen, in the New Jerusalem, the city we're going to see in chapters 21 and 22. Don't get so caught up in the streets of gold and gates of pearl. It's not what it's about. It's about the people of God, the bride of Christ. In fact, John is told this city that you see coming down out of heaven from God is the bride of Christ. It's the people of God. So Augustine talked about the people of God and he referred to it as the city of God and he contrasted it with the world system that he called the city of earth or the earthly city. According to Augustine, the city of God is marked by people who forego earthly pleasure to dedicate themselves to the eternal truths of God. The earthly city, on the other hand, consists of people who have immersed themselves in the cares and pleasures of this present passing world. Augustine argued that the city of God would ultimately triumph over all. And so it's not surprising that John uses this symbol of city to refer to the people of this world who have rebelled against and rejected God and the systems that they work through. 
Look at the characteristics. Again, we won't read it in its entirety, but just the bullet points. This city, which again, are these commercial political systems under the control of ungodly people. It is rich, politically powerful, sexually immoral, and de demon infested. It says it's the haunt of every demon and wicked spirit there is. And I'm telling you, um, we don't see it often manifest the way it did in Bible days when Jesus cast demons out of people, but it manifests. It's very powerful, the demonic influence in our society and cultures all around. I mean, you look at some of the movies they advertise. Look at some of the music that is produced. Even the titles of the music, the lyrics of the music. It's demonic. It's demonic. And of course, what is terrorism? It's demonic activity manifesting in violence against the innocent. Yeah. Secondly, it is brutal in its exploitation of vulnerable human beings. You will note among the other commodities that this system traffics in, it says she trafficked in the bodies and souls of men. Verse 13, that's human trafficking, which is big today, isn't it? It's going on everywhere. Young women, here in this country, a white van pulls up, grabs a young teenage girl off the street, She's not seen or heard from again. That happens frequently now. We're hearing it more and more. Um, trafficking in the bodies and souls of men. Jeffrey Epstein, classic case. Billionaire. High society. Prince Andrew hobnobbing. Other former presidents hobnobbed with him. And so on and so forth. The rich and the famous. And even Bill Gates got associated with him. And yet we find out that he was using underage girls, buying them essentially to satisfy his lusts. And then what happens to them? Who knows? And he's not the only one. And he is not the only one. It's systemic. It is systemic. It's in the system. That's the idea. Number three. This great city is doomed to perish under the just wrath of God through these bold judgments. And it comes swiftly as the great city Babylon will be thrown down in violence and will never be found again. We're told these plagues will overtake her in a single day. It doesn't take God long to bring judgment when He gets ready to judge. Death and mourning and famine she'll be completely consumed by fire. For the Lord God who judges her is mighty. And people will say, how terrible, how terrible for that great city. The ship owners became wealthy by transporting her great wealth on the seas. In a single moment's gone. All gone. Remember when the towers were struck on 9-11? And within two hours, they were gone. I mean, it, it's not that far-fetched. So in the light of this coming destruction of this Babylon system, another voice from heaven calls out warning God's people. Listen up, you who are God's people. Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins or you will be punished with her. No, pastor, I prayed the sinner's prayer. I'm saved, I'm okay. But if you're partaking in her sins, you're going to partake in her judgment. If you're watching pornography as a regular thing and it's got its grip on you, God is speaking through this verse, come out from that, my people. Do not partake in her immorality and her obscenities. Get it out of your heart, out of your life and get yourself out from in front of that computer screen. Or phone. Come on. Right. For her sins are piled as high as heaven and God remembers her evil deeds. And you know at the present time, God's people today are being confronted by the same Babylon spirit as John was in the time that he wrote this. It is the systemic rebellion that infects every facet of this present world. May we heed this warning call to come away from her 
and not partake of her sins. Amen. Next time, we will we'll look at the battle of Armageddon, the millennial reign, and the great white throne of judgment. God bless you. Thank you for being with us, Father. I just pray that the God of hope will fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that we may be filled with his hope as we are in this season when we are reminded that God sent his light, his son, into a dark world and gave us not just hope for a time, but eternal hope in Christ. We praise you for that in Jesus' name.